uh, after meeting him, after meeting him, I, I had to unlearn so many things in dentistry and then relearn them. And his passion for teaching just doesn't stop. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave uh, this, this floor open to Balasa to introduce Stuart. Yeah, shall we go ahead at 5 p.m. or shall we start straight away? You can start the introduction. 5 p.m. we'll start the lecture. Okay, fine. Uh, good evening, all. It's a warm welcome from Idea Walter. This is uh, Idea Walter's second CDE program, and uh, it is a honor to us. Uh, it's a great uh, this one from Idea Walter that we could have a senior person like uh, Dr. Stuart Jones. Dr. Stuart Jones is in a towering personality. Okay, though Stuart Jones lectures and Dr. Stuart Orton Jones lectures and teaches around the world, he believes that truly effective teaching involves participants doing the procedures rather than hearing the webinars or something like that. The presentations which he developed or he has developed over the period of time are easily understood and make relatively complex subjects easily understandable. It is as simple as that you are eating a banana without the peel. So he makes the subject so easy. All his presentations are available to view and download at no cost on his website. He believes that true teaching should be a participant oriented, not a presenter oriented. His practical teaching sessions are highly appreciated by those attending them because they are involved in doing practical exercises and not just listening to lectures. He currently teaches on the American Academy of Dental Implantology year courses in the US, in Oregon, Abu Dhabi, India, and Malaysia. He extensively lectures. He also lectured at several inter international conferences, including Jordan, Egypt, India, and the United States. Dr. Stuart Orton Jones has a comprehensive knowledge and experience of dentistry and has attended numerous courses and conferences in Europe, North America, the Middle East, and the Asia. He has lectured extensively at home and abroad. He's, he studied at the Guy's Hospital Dental School, London, the Northwestern Dental School, Chicago, and the Panky Institute in Miami. He has conducted highly intensive practical courses on many subjects, including occlusion, apply, appliance therapy, the treatment of headaches, and TMJ problems, restorative dentistry, quality dentistry, complete dentures, and implantology. He is a member of the following organizations, the Association of Dental Implantologists UK, the American Academy of Implant Dentistry AID, and the Alabama Implant Study Group. All his presentations are available at uh, stuartjones.com. Okay, anyone who is interested can visit his website and download his presentations at free of cost. I welcome you, Dr. Stuart or, or Jones. I think what I told you is a small drop in the ocean because the amount of subject you have, uh, you are a towering personality and we are graced, Idea Walter is graced by your lecture. Thank you. Okay, Tejas. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful session. Uh, I thank Idea Voltaire for giving me this opportunity to coordinate with uh, Stuart. And uh, like I said, his uh, uh, I'd like to recount one, one small incident. Uh, I, I happened to host him in Hyderabad for an occlusion workshop and he runs on time. So he told me that tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., we are leaving the house. And at 5.45, he's ready in his, he's completely dressed, waiting for me to wake up. And from 7 a.m., we started the, the workshop, till 7 p.m., he went on without a drop of water. He's so dedicated, and I, I welcome all of you to take advantage of his experience 
and uh, also visit his website. There's so much of information there. It'll take, if you go through his website and all his presentations, it's going to take you a lot of time just going through it. And the subject is so de uh, in-depth and complete. Um, you'll be really amazed at uh, his dedication to teach. So I welcome all of you to this session. Stuart. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very we have uh, 10 minutes to start. So if you want to chat with the participants, uh, you can do that. And then we can start in 10 minutes. Oh, we're waiting for 10 minutes. Good yes. evening, Eldo. How are you? Yeah, good, sir. Thank you. How about you? Eldo doesn't always concentrate. He's uh, looking out to the window. Sarisha, how are you? Hi, Stuart. Hello. Hi, Stuart. How are you? Surabi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> yes, it's good to see you. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry I'm not seeing you in person. Oh. Very soon. And hopefully soon. Very soon, everybody will join in. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> hi, hi. When does anybody uh, when does anybody think it's going to be safe for me to come to India? Yeah, Tomorrow. we are eager to welcome you. Uh, it's it's safe already. I was I was told last week it wasn't safe. Last time it wasn't, but now it's quite safe. Really? So you should plan very early. Seriously, I was I was talking to somebody in uh, Lucknow who said there's no COVID in Lucknow. Yeah, it's quite possible. I think that's impossible. There's no country where there's no COVID. There are many countries where there is no COVID. Oh, many. I don't believe it. Their their recording <laughs> systems are not very good. There are many, Stuart. Many. Well, I had COVID two weeks ago. My brother had it two weeks ago, and other friends of mine have had it as well recently. So we still, we've we've still got it. Uh, we suffered uh, uh, in March uh, last year, and uh, in Jan this uh, no, not in Jan, early Feb, I can say. Mm. And uh, both the times it was mild, thanks to God. Yeah. Yeah. So plan to. We are eager to welcome you. Okay. Yeah. Koti, is that your first name? It is. I shan't attempt. I shan't attempt to say your last name. That's too difficult for me. VJ, how are you? VJ not responding. How are I you, Adi? He just unmute everyone, right? I think that's better. Mm. <coughs> so we got we got five minutes. Uh, if you unmute everyone, there'll be a lot of echo. Uh, so one-on-one, uh, -on -one, if anybody wants to uh, respond and talk, uh, you can just press your space bar and then uh, talk okay. if you want to continue. Okay. Fine. <clears throat> Dr. Stewart? Yes. So what are your hobbies? Uh, dentistry. Apart from dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> good food. Good food. Oh. Uh, you like seafood? And I have a, uh, I have a racing car. Which one? Uh, it's a very, it's a, um, um, it's a small little racing car, and I go, uh, I should be going to uh, 
to Belgium to the uh, Spa race circuit in, oh, in wow. June. I go once a year. I used to go out once a month in my racing car on track days, but uh, I don't do that so much now. Fine. No, I, uh, uh, I've never been married, but um, my hobbies are dentistry, good food, motor racing, and women. But I don't have time for the last one. You're a very lucky person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> when I um, when I'm lecturing, I sometimes say that um, I never I've never been married. It's the only mistake I haven't made yet. And uh, all the men are nodding. <laughs> the women are upset. <laughs> uh. So how many people do we have now, Tejas? Uh, so 32. 32. Ah. I remember going to uh, India for the first or second time many years ago. And uh, this friend of mine said, oh, yes, we're going to have 100 people at the lecture. And as it got closer, to the actual lecture itself, the numbers went down until when we actually got to the lecture, there were 20. <laughs> I think we are doing better now. <laughs> um, I have to prepare you all with the fact that uh, I love coming to India and um, I'm very amused about some of the characteristics of uh, of Indian people. So, um, um, although I might be uh, um, a little uh, uh, sarcastic about India in some ways, um, I actually enjoy coming to India. So, uh, excuse me. I never no, intend. I never intend to offend anybody. No, no, that's fine at all. That's fine. But you should, you should be visiting India soon. Uh, you can see the uh, the presentation, can you, Tejas? Yeah. Yes, we can see the presentation. Okay. I think we are good to start now. It's five. Yeah, we can start. Okay. Um, I'm very pleased to be with you today. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not with you in person. I would prefer to be with you in person because I prefer to uh, um, interact with the people that I'm teaching. Uh, somebody told me a statistic uh, uh, a while back, which said that uh, if you lecture, people pick up about 7% of what you're saying. If you teach a practical course, they pick up 50%. So I much per prefer to doing practical things. Um, on the screen, you'll see uh, my website and my email address. Um, uh, and I'm also recording uh, this session. So if you miss something, you can always go back uh, or you can go to my website and uh, have a look at the presentation. Um, I welcome questions during the uh, session at any time you've got any questions. Um, make notes because there's some things that I'm gonna recommend to you uh, which you may want to do something about. <clears throat> and if you make a note, uh, you're more likely to do something. Uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, amongst you all, <clears throat> there is a great variety of, uh, of abilities from people that are very new in dentistry to very experienced people. Uh, I aim to teach the people who are most inexperienced um, and the more experienced people pick up just a few things. Uh, so I would recommend that you take a photograph of the, um, uh, my email address and my uh, 
uh, website so that you can contact me at any time if you wish to, um, or you can look at my presentations um, at a later date. I'm starting by talking about the uh, surgical items required uh, because often I go to places where I'm teaching in a clinic and it, life is very difficult for them because they don't have all the items um, they need. I went to my friend um, Eldo Koshe in, um, <clears throat> in Cochin <clears throat> and he um, was doing a surgery and I took all the instruments with me that, 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 that I think he needed. And after the procedure, he said, oh, where can I get all these different items? And I said, well, if you buy them from me, I'll buy some new ones. So he ended up with a good set of surgical instruments. Uh, so uh, do um, uh, uh, get in touch with me with any questions you have today or by email in the future. Now, as I said, I'm really talking to the inexperienced people. So I may be showing you some things which uh, are very simple, um, but uh, you may find a number of these things very valuable to you. Uh, starting off, an essential thing obviously is a scalpel handle and generally speaking, number 15 blades. Now I'm gonna show you uh, how to fit a scalpel blade. Strangely, because I uh, teach practical things, I, um, uh, I can see in a group of 20 people that there are two or three people who don't know how to uh, put a scalpel blade on. Uh, this amazes me, but um, I'm just going to show you a method of how to, to put a scalpel blade on safely. Now assume makes an ass of you and me. So I'm not assuming that everybody in the group here can put a blade on. Uh, now you look at the angle on the handle, you look at the angle on the blade and you have to match them up so they fit together. So just watch this video now of a good way to teach your staff how to put a blade on. Now I've got the angle wrong, so I'm going to turn the blade over to get it correct. And then I'm going to finally push it on with some needle holders. So looking at that in detail then, it's a case of opening the packet, don't take the blade out uh, with your hands. You then match up the uh, angles and these are not correct. So they have to be the same. So we turn it over and then push the handle onto the blade and then take the needle holders to push it on. The next thing is how to remove a scalpel blade. And you take the end here, you turn it outwards and you push with your thumb to take it off. So you take the base, you turn it out, and then you push it off. This is a safe way of removing the blade. And this is how you should teach your, your staff. The next instrument needed is a uh, periost elevator. Uh, I know a company in the United States, the Tatum Surgical, who has eight different types of periosteal elevator for various different procedures. This one is the basic one, which is what the periosteal elevator that everybody should have. It has a pointed end here, which is used for pushing under a papilla when raising a flap. 
when raising flaps, put a finger on the flap as you push. This stops the situation where you suddenly find the flaps free and you damage the flap because it's moved too quickly. So the keeping the finger on the on the flap just protects the flap when you're raising it. You then turn the periosteal elevator round to raise the papilla and put your finger on when you're doing this. And then you change to the, the, the spoon end and raise the flap up on the relieving incision here. The next thing is uh, needle holders. Uh, you'll notice that the instruments I'm recommending here are very simple, and there's usually only one of each type of thing. Uh, I have friends in India who, when I visited them, they have several different types of needle holder. Totally unnecessary. You only need one type. The other thing is, you notice the bevel on here. Uh, you can buy them with a bevel, or you put the bevel on yourselves. And I'll show you why you need to do this. When you don't have a bevel, you sometimes can find that the suture gets caught in the hinge. Whereas with a bevel here, it just slides past. So if you don't have a bevel in your needle holders, you need to uh, take a fissure burr in the high speed and cut the bevels on there. When you've done that, you take a rubber wheel just to smooth them up. Now, uh, I was teaching in Los Angeles in America, and um, I taught uh, them about this beveling the uh, needle holders. And one of the participants sent me an email about three months later saying, I didn't do what you suggested. Um, and this morning I got, got the thread caught in the hinge of my needle holders. So I'm now going to uh, put the bevel on uh, uh, when I finish today. So um, either put a bevel on yourselves in the next few days or wait till you next catch the thread and then put the bevel on. Now, tissue pickups, um, again, a particular friend of mine um, uh, I know has about three or four or five different types of tissue pickups. You only need these 15.5 centimeter tissue pickups and they've got little teeth on them like for, for, for getting hold of the flaps, the tissue. I noticed that some people have these need, these tissue pickups. These are for plastic surgery, for skin, not for going into the mouth, unless you're a pediatrician when you've got small little mouths you're working in. Um, so if you've got some of these, go back and get some of these. Uh, scissors, this is the only scissors you need. This does everything you want from removing sutures to cutting sutures to cutting tissue. These are the only uh, scissors you need, apart from, from some medicine balm scissors, which I'll show you in a few minutes. This is the only probe you need. 
The amount of different types of probes I come across in dental clinics is amazing. And it's only confusing having so many different types. This has a periodontal probe on one end and an explorer on the other end. Now, I probably use this end as much as I use this end. Um, I'm disappointed with some of my friends that I teach in India that they don't use this very often. I asked them about the patient's gums and they know very little. They know about the holes and where to put implants, but they don't know much about the gum. These, this is available, this is a Hugh Freedy XP6 forward slash W and is available from this uh, company here in India. Now this is a probe which is um, for, for checking uh, implant sites to make sure there's no breakage of the bone. Uh, you can make one of these from a period, periodontal probe by just straightening it out. The idea is that you go in and you feel the end very carefully uh, when you are placing implants in the upper anterior region and in the sinus area. You're feeling to see what you feel at the end. Uh, you could feel good bone at the end, or you, it could be very thin at the end, very thin bone, and you have to be extremely careful not to probe through that very thin bone. Or there may be no bone at the end, and there may be, may be uh, nasal lining or sinus lining present. Uh, this doesn't matter, okay? Uh, the problem arises when there's no bone and no lining at all, uh, and this is a problem. Now, this is uh, Rico, who was a, an African uh, uh, hedgehog, and Rico used to like to have a little swim in a bath, and he liked uh, watching uh, tennis on television. The question is, how do you stroke a hedgehog? You stroke a hedgehog very carefully. So when you probe a socket, checking for bone, you have to do it extremely carefully. Having, having probed the end, and may I say that if anybody uh, is listening, watching, who places implants, I would say that you should check every single socket with a probe like this, so you know what the, uh, the bone is like. Uh, all the way along the socket. So then you show, and then you, you go palately and then buckly with your finger on the outside, just feeling to see how the buckle plate is, whether it's present or not. Then you can put your implant in. And I would recommend putting implants in using a handpiece because the handpiece then uh, doesn't wobble as much as when you do it by hand. Now, the essential stages of, of treating pa patients with gum disease is firstly, the initial plaque removal by the patient. And I would probably, taking on a new patient, not do anything like scaling and polishing for three months or more after I first meet the patient. To actually do this, scaling and polishing before the patient can look after themselves is a very, um, not a good thing to do, although it's very commonly done. The problem with this is it takes away the responsibility of the patient. After the patient is good at plaque removal, then I would do uh, a, a, a scale and curatage uh, <clears throat> quadrant by quadrant. Then I would reassess them, and I may then do some more advanced uh, gum surgery. And all this can be done by a general practitioner or by a periodontist, but, but this is the duty of the general practitioner. Now, how many uh, scalers do you need? Uh, I go into some clinics, and they've got numerous different types of shapes. 
you only actually need two scalars. The Gracie 1718S and the Gracie 1314S. These are the only ones you need. Now, also, I would ask how many of you uh, sharpen your scalars? Some people I come across have never sharpened their scalars. So I'm going to show you now the best way to sharpen the scalars. These are the things you need. You need a little sharpening round sharpening stone and some emery cloth, which is used to just smooth off the ends where there's a little bit of thin uh, metal. So this is the way that I'd recommend you sharpen these instruments. And then you smooth it with this uh, emery paper. And then sharpening this uh, the other scaler, the fourteen S scaler. I often, uh, when I'm talking about this, the first thing that the uh, some of the people in the audience uh, ask is, where do I buy one of those sharpening stones? So uh, the first and most important thing is to get a sharpening stone so you can actually sharpen your instruments. Now, uh, this patient, um, I've got the patient under very good plaque control. And I've done a, a simple uh, uh, scale, and, uh, scale and polish. And I'm now going to do a scale and curatage, which is the basic, simple periodontal treatment. There's no need to raise flaps and things. Scale and curatage has been found to be just as effective as all this different type of um, periodontal surgery. First thing to do is to curate out all the granulation tissue using the Gracie 1718S. You feel for the granulation tissue and you pull it out. Um, then take a simple excavator and do some more scaling. This excavator is the only excavator you need. Again, I come across people who've got about five or six different excavators. You only need one simple excavator, and this can be used for removing uh, uh, tooth decay and removing granulation tissue. Having scale, having cleaned out as much of the granulation tissue as possible, I then would use an ultrasonic scaler and then I would do root planing. Now, when you're doing root planing, to start with, when you go up and down, you can feel, you can hear like going up and down sandpaper. It's very rough. And then as you continue, having gone up and down about 15 to 20 times, you then find that the squeak, the uh, noise stops. The scraping sound stops. This is root planing. So here I'm root planing with the 1718S. Then I go to the uh, 1314S and root plane 
up and down until the scraping sound stops. Then I know the, the surface is clean. What we're trying to do here is to uh, get the root surface so that it's easy for the, the patient to, to remove the plaque. Then I would go back to using the Gracie 1314 S again. Uh, and then I would curate out any remaining granulation tissue. And then I do some more root planing uh, with the ultrasonic. Uh, in the upper, this might, I might book the patient in for an hour and a quarter. Uh, in the lower, because it takes a little longer to anesthetize, um, to put the local anesthetic in, buckley and mandibular block, uh, I might allow an hour and a half. I would then see the patient two weeks later to get them back to cleaning again, because they don't clean very well for about two weeks because of the soreness. Um, and then I'd see them a month later, see how they're getting on, and then I do the next quadrant. So I do this quadrant by quadrant. The hand pieces you need in uh, surgery, you need a 20 to one reducing hand piece for uh, uh, drilling implant uh, uh, sites. This is a uh, one to five speed increasing hand piece, uh, which takes friction grip burrs and you can put into these, um, say, a tungsten carbide burr for a smoothing off bone. Uh, this is a beautiful handpiece. Uh, it's a, a narrow nose handpiece. Uh, the wider ones, uh, when you're doing some uh, tunnel grafting procedures, can tear the, the, uh, the incision line, whereas these narrow nose ones uh, fit in much better. Here, i am uh, done a tunnel graft here and going to put uh, a bone graft in underneath, but I need to just uh, make some little holes in the bone, make some little holes in the bone uh, to let the blood come out into the graft. Uh, I have a, a burr block, uh, which contains these burrs here, uh, two, six, 10, 40, 12, 14, 16 rounds. And these are the sort of burrs that are used in all uh, um, grafting procedures. Uh, the burr block is magnetic. Um, so you lose less burrs because when you finish using one burr and you, you throw it near the uh, burr block, it just glips onto it straight away. Here I'm using a 10 round uh, to start a sinus graft uh, window uh, development. Uh, we need some gauze, um, 7.5 by 7.5 uh, in sterile packs. Um, I know you buy them in big rolls and then cut them, but if you cut them to this size and then uh, bag them, uh, need some uh, small and large metal bowls for putting graft material in. And also, uh, if you have in the larger bowl some saline, the assistant can clean the needle holders and other instruments uh, to remove blood. Um, uh, I often use travel with these little plastic containers. Uh, I've got the, these are uh, the sort of containers that um, uh, Chinese takeaway uh, food people uh, put their uh, sauces in. And uh, you can buy these by the sort of 200 if you find out where, where to get them from. So uh, here is one of those large metal bowls used for putting the betadine in when uh, prepping a patient. And here's uh, some. Uh, uh, cancellous particulate bone uh, with antibiotic in a bowl. Um, for grafting, <clears throat> I would use uh, irradiated cancellous bone 
and uh, bone blocks. Um, I used to take uh, bone from the chin or the ramus, but uh, more recently uh, I've been using these little bone blocks. Uh, a body gauge is a good thing to have. Uh, one way of uh, deciding on the height of the ridge is to put the uh, uh, top beak uh, into the nose over the piriform fossa onto the ridge and then um, taking the measurement or using the other end of the Bowley gauge uh, to measure the uh, uh, lower uh, symphysial height here. I mean, I think that if you've got a little old lady coming in in her 80s, and you're going to put in some mini implants for an overdenture um, to have them have to go and get a uh, scan, I think is, uh, is unnecessary when you can do this. So you might find this is 20 millimeters. So take off five millimeters for uh, tissue. And uh, so you can put an implant in, you know, 16 millimeters long or 18 millimeters long. This is an inox measurer, which I found very valuable for checking things like the widths of teeth. Um, I modified some for, for measuring the actual gap because I uh, did orthodontics as well as all the other procedures. I needed these instruments. This is a Metzenbaum scissors. And these are for, uh, for dissecting uh, under tissue, you push them under the flap and then open them and the tissue opens along the fascial planes. So here I'm putting the scissors in and I'm opening them and this uh, makes more uh, available flap so that uh, when suturing, having put the block in, uh, there's no tension in the suture line. Uh, this is an Orban knife, and this is used for uh, doing split thickness flaps. In a situation like this, raising a flap in the palate, um, I'm splitting the connective tissue here, so leaving the periosteum and some connective tissue here. It just means that when you put the flap back again, the flap rests on the uh, periosteum, not just straight onto bone. Uh, so it glues on better. Uh, this is a uh, sterilizable aspirator tubing. And um, this is so much more convenient than a lot of the other aspirator tubing, especially the high velocity aspirator tubing, which is quite heavy to hold. Uh, we pack them, uh, double pack them with the actual tip already attached. So we don't have to attach the tip when we're um, doing surgery. These are available from Salvin Dental, uh, which is an American company. And uh, if you Google Salvin, uh, they will send you um, any items you need. They are a company in America that sells a lot of surgical stuff uh, for implantology. So this is the tip that I recommend. I don't like the plastic ones. I prefer these metal ones. And you need some little brushes for cleaning these tubes. Uh, we also, if we're doing sinus grafting and there's a lot of uh, water spray, we might have a saliva ejector like this um, to put into the patient's mouth, as well as the other aspirator. Um, I teach a little group of about six to eight people in India once a week. And I was curious to find that uh, one of them particularly uh, didn't know how to bend this aspirator tubing. So I made a little video which I'll show you. It, it needs to lie along the 
like this. This is more comfortable for the patient. So you make this first bend. And then you check to see this is a bit too long. It's going too far towards the back of the mouth. So I'm shortening it a little bit. That's about the right length. You notice it's not, the tip is not pointing downwards. Now adjusting it so it goes over the teeth. Then bending it so it goes downwards, the other side of the patient on the patient's chin. Uh, I come across a, a friend of mine who bent it like this. When that goes into the patient's mouth, the tip where the suction is uh, sucks up the tissue and doesn't suck up the saliva. So that's not the, the, the best way of doing it. Uh, this tubing needs to be cleaned. Uh, and I didn't do this for a month or two. And then I got hold of this um, uh, uh, shower hose. I took the end and I put it onto uh, the uh, sink tap and I turned the cold water on. And for about 24 hours, there was still stuff coming out. So uh, we now do this after every uh, surgical procedure. Uh, draping the patient for surgery. Uh, we use the uh, packs. I know you use uh, cloth uh, um, items, uh, which you sterilize yourselves. This is the uh, Salvin pack. Now, I want you to look at this closely and see what you can see that's wrong. Do you notice his hand is dropped down? You should have your hands above your waist when you're wearing sterile gloves. So here, this friend of mine is putting the uh, drape on. Then he's going to hand the uh, aspirated tubing uh, to the roving assistant who's going to attach it to the main aspiration system on the right there. And then he's going to attach it to the uh, drape using a Lorna clamp. This is a clamp which doesn't have sharp little teeth on, so it's got lots of little teeth. So when it uh, uh, is goes through, uh, holds the, um, the drape. It doesn't go through and get contaminated by the patient's uh, clothing. The next thing is to make sure that the tubing is long enough there so that you can aspirate well. It's frustrating when you come to aspirate and it isn't pulled through enough. Here we now have the um, implant motor cable underneath the uh, Lorna clamp as well. 
Now, uh, I always use tin foil for covering the uh, light handles like this. The advantage of that is that if you touch the handle with your head and contaminate the cover, you can actually hear that you've done it. Whereas if you use these plastic uh, disposable um, uh, covers, you can't hear anything if you contaminate them. Extraction forceps are another thing. <laughs> you only need two types of extraction forceps. Um, again, I'm thinking of when I was in uh, Kotayam with my dear friend Sebastian, and uh, he had a great container full of full of um, uh, extraction forceps, children's ones, all different shapes. You only need, uh, for adults and children, you only need a pair like this and like this. This is also assuming that you're going to use luxators, which I'll show you in a few minutes. So those are the only forceps you need. Um, I can go into a lot of clinics and uh, go through all their instruments and their burrs and things. And I can reduce the amount of instruments that they deal with down to about a third. And they put the instruments which they've decided they don't need in a special drawer. Um, and for a month or two, they use the reduced number of instruments that I've recommended. And gradually, those are instruments in that drawer seem to come out again. So when I go back there a year later, they all seem to have come out again. Um, tooth and root removal can mainly be done with luxators, which I'll show you. Uh, this pre preserves the bone. Okay, when you use forceps, it tends to, uh, to expand the bone out whereas luxators don't tend to do that quite so much. Uh, these are the Tatum luxators. They've got metal handles on. So if you need to, uh, you can just tap on them uh, with lightly with a mallet when you're using these instruments. I had a pair of plastic handle ones, which are okay, except that out of the six or seven uh, instruments, uh, two of them have got broken handles. So the metal handle ones are better. They come in uh, several different shapes uh, so you can reach all aspects of the mouth. Again, um, if I was uh, teaching you uh, in person rather than over Zoom, I would say, how many of you use luxators? And I would then say, how many of you sharpen your luxators and uh, there'd be a lot of embarrassed people um a friend of mine who i'll show you in a minute him removing a tooth uh sharpens his after every use or his assistants do so you need the same rod that i showed you before and the emery paper and this is how you would uh, sharpen one of these instruments. You look at the angle of the sharp bit at the end. And then you take the emery paper and you just uh, microscopically, microscopically, there would be a little little pieces of, of uh, metal which you have to uh, polish off. Again, if you don't sharpen your luxators, the first thing you might have to do is to buy one of those stones, and then sharpen them after each use. So. You go in against the tooth 
and push upwards and then go round and move over a little bit. And then the tooth eventually comes out. It's a great feeling. You think uh, the tooth not gonna come out and then eventually it does. So this is uh, a friend of mine in the States removing an upper uh, first molar roots and a second molar <clears throat> using the Luxator number three and four. And finally, once he's got it pretty loose, he then uses some, uh, some forceps. Uh, he said that he emphasizes doing deliberately and slowly pushing hard. Uh, don't use the Luxator for elevating. If you use the Luxator for elevating, you will break the Luxator. It is not an elevator. Use it to move around the tooth. Uh, you know when you're doing it correctly, when you have inserted the Luxator far enough that Luxator stands in place against the tooth without finger support. Use forceps only if there's persistent resistance when you're taking the tooth out. And he uses Luxators for every tooth removal. Okay, we're going to take out uh, number two, number two, and number two, number You notice he's using a mirror to retract. Uh, I disagree with him on that, and I'll show you what I would recommend you use. To see how that's staying in place. When you're doing this, it's very easy to feel that the tooth net will never come out. And then eventually it comes loose. He's just taking out the roots of the tooth in front now. I would also want him to have some gauze in the back of the mouth to protect the airway. So now he's got the tooth pretty loose. He's just going to use some forceps just to do the last little bit. Thank you. 
He's going to be putting some implants in. That's why he wants to make sure he doesn't lose any of the bone. This is a pair of rongeurs. These are for trimming uh, sharp edges of uh, bridges. These are end cutting ones, two different sizes. Patient preparation for surgery. The patient carer's duties, and we used to have one person who would look after a patient from the point that they arrive to the time that they're sedated, um, because patients are quite nervous when they're having surgery done. Um, so she needs to anticipate what the patient's gonna be like when they arrive in terms of nervousness, and she needs to prepare all the necessary items and have them checked by the dentist. Uh, this is the uh, chlorhexidine rinse she needs to get ready, the gel for brushing the teeth if the teeth are present, uh, a toothbrush for brushing on the gel, uh, ibuprofen, uh, an antibiotic if that's what uh, the drug regime is. And the dentist needs to check this because we're responsible for the patient's life and uh, it's not the duty of the assistant to take on that uh, job. So we need some better dine and a prep kit. This is already packed with sterile gloves, uh, the uh, Alice forceps. This is for um, holding the gauze. Needle holders don't work as well because these have got nice long beaks on them. Whereas when you use uh, uh, needle holders, uh, they aren't long enough. And the end of the uh, gauze uh, is sort of floppy and uh, doesn't work as well. So here is uh, somebody prepping a patient uh, before uh, surgery. I prefer to use the betadine so long as the patient's not allergic to uh, iodine uh, for the, rather than chlorhexidine because you can't see with chlorhexidine uh, where you've been. Uh, this is a mouth gag, which I preferred to use rather than a bite block. Uh, here's one in place. And you notice that the patient's got some gauze to protect the airway. It's got a tongue cheek retractor uh, holding the gauze in place and then the mouth gag. So here's another on the right here, you can see the mouth gag. It just helps the patient uh, because it's quite difficult to keep your mouth open all the time. And this prevents the situation where you look away and when you look back again, the patients close their mouth. Uh, these are tongue and cheek retractors. Uh, this is the part that's used for retracting the cheek. And these are, this is for retracting the tongue. They come in uh, three different sizes. And here I'm holding the uh, tongue and cheek retractor to retract the cheek uh, using a pen grip. Here I'm using a palm grip. This is on a, on a patient. I prefer to use this rather than a mirror. Um, and here we've got the, uh, at the top there, you can see the tongue and cheek retractor. The assistant is probably holding this. And here's the uh, tongue retractor in place. This time there's a bike block in, uh, in the, instead of the, uh, um, the gag. Uh, I like these Minnesota retractors. Uh, they've got a cheek retractor on one end and a flat retractor on the other end. Uh, this is better than using a periosteal elevator, which isn't wide enough to retract the tissue. So here um, is a Minnesota retractor in place. Uh, 
this is the setup that I'd be doing uh, implant surgery. The assistants pass the tongue and cheek retractor. Now I put in the gag and she's passing a, a cheek retractor to the assistant. And then I'm going to be holding a, uh, a cheek retractor like that. This is a... Uh, a Stuart, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Uh, there are two questions. Yes. Uh, Dr. Balakrishna is asking a question. Which is? Uh, doctor, go ahead. You can ask a question. Uh, his question is, uh, what's the advantage of using the periotome more rather than forceps once you elevate the flap? Um, I wouldn't be elevating the flap for a start. Um, I used to, but I wouldn't elevate the flap when taking out teeth. Uh, you need the uh, periosteum with the blood supply to the uh, cortical bone in place. If you reflect the flap back, you're taking away 100% of the arterial blood supply and uh, 80, no, it's 80% 80 of, um, of the arterial blood supply and 100% of the uh, venous return. So I wouldn't be raising a flap for a start. Uh, also, um, you're trying to preserve as much bone as possible. And by using the luxators to go up the um, periodontal membrane and cutting the periodontal membrane, you're doing the least amount of damage uh, to the bone. Uh, using forceps, uh, you're much more likely to crack the bone. So um, uh, I think that progressively people will be using luxators. By the way, uh, luxators and peritomes are the same thing. Uh, it's just a difference in the American terminology and the, uh, um, the rest of the world. Uh, another question? Uh, no, one, one question related to this. Can uh, a periotome be malleted? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. Uh, that's why I said you need to use the metal ones rather than the plastic ones. Okay. Right. Great. Um, um, the, the second question is yeah. from Dr. Vijay. Uh, Dr. Vijay, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. My question is, uh, my question is about the uh, trauma that can be caused by extracting a third molar, which is involving the sinus. So, how to manage that uh, trauma to the sinus lining that happens while uh, extracting a third molar? Could you repeat that, uh, Tejas? Yeah, uh, he says while extracting a third molar, the maxillary third molar, how do you uh, manage the trauma to the sinus lining? Um, if you suspect, uh, if you suspect that the uh, the lining might have been torn, then you have to close the flap over the top. You have to raise the flap. Uh, either palatally or buccally, uh, preferably palatally, and you move a pedicle flap over the, the, uh, the hole in the uh, socket uh, to cover it up. I think that you probably get tears in the sinus lining more frequently than you know. And the amount of times you actually end up with an oroantral fistula is um is pretty pretty low um i've got a lovely presentation on closing uh oriental fistulas using a buckle flap technique 
knuckle fat pad technique. Um, I've done this once myself and uh, uh, another uh, oral surgeon showed me how to do it. Um, it's a nice little procedure. Uh, any other questions? Okay, let's uh, move on now. Ask any questions at any time, okay? Um, this is a ridge mapper. This is used for uh, measuring the ridge. Um, these are less needed now with scanning, but on the other hand, I think it's a useful thing to have uh, to be able to measure. This has to be done under local anesthetic, by the way. Okay, um, maybe uh, confirming the ridge width when you are uh, doing the procedure. Uh, these are Maltz curettes. Um, these are used for curating out cysts and incisal canals. Um, if you want to put implants in the upper anterior, and there's a wide incisal canal, then the best thing to do is to clean out the canal um, and graft the canal and then leave it for three or four months and then go ahead and put the implants in. Uh, the fact that you're removing the blood supply that comes through the incisal canal and you're also removing the nerve supply does not have any effect on patients at all. It's not a problem. Sinus retractors, uh, when doing a sinus graft, one of the problems is not damaging the inferior dental bundle. So here are, is a retractor that Dr. Tatum devised. The tip here is actually turned downwards. So it's less likely to, to, to damage the inferior dental bundle. Retraction when doing sinus grafting is, is a problem and it's easily solved by these instruments. You see this beautiful access here uh, to the, the lateral wall of the sinus. These come in uh, four different sizes. These are uh, sin Tatum sinus elevators. These are just beautiful instruments. When I see some of the other instruments sold by other companies, they're not in any way as good as these ones. You need a mallet um, and uh, there are some small little mallets and there's some big mallets. <clears throat> this Tatum uh, mallet is the ideal weight. Expansion and contraction instruments. Um, the, this is a bone scalpel. When expanding a ridge, you start with a normal scalpel blade and tap it up into the ridge and then go to a bone scalpel, a four millimeter and then a five millimeter, then a bone blade, which is slightly wider. And then you go to these round instruments uh, to form your socket. Uh, occasionally you need this D1 instrument for in the upper anterior region where you've had recession, you need to bring out the buckle plate. So you put this in and you lever the buckle plate out. Um, when I was doing uh, clinical dentistry, which I haven't done since 2012, um, I would place 70% of implants using expansion instruments without using any drilling. And then this is the final instrument for making the socket. You need offset instruments because when you put a straight instrument in, the upper cheek gets in the way. So you need these offset instruments. Uh, these are the different shapes that are available. Uh, these are microtomes. 
they come uh, these smaller ones and then the longer ones here and this is where in this situation with this patient the ridge is too high so we want to do a ridge repositioning procedure to bring the ridge down and these instruments make a cut just on the outside of the periodontal membrane of the lateral incisor here. This is the address of uh, Tatum Surgical in, 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 uh, um, in America. Uh, a friend of mine in Holland wanted some instruments and they don't, Tatum Surgical don't uh, send them to Europe. So he just sent the instruments to me and then I just sent them on to this friend of mine. This is a, um, in our, uh, an in-safe syringe. Uh, it's got a cover on the end. The instance and effects of needle stick injury, 56% of dentists have at least one needle stick injury per year. Most industries are during the removal and disposal of the needles. So it's the assistants who have most needle stick injuries. Most needle stick injuries are after the injection has been administered. So if it's going to be, it could be contaminated. The transmission rates after needle stick injury from an infected patient if the patient's got AIDS or HIV, there's a one in 300 chance of getting AIDS or HIV. Hepatitis C, there's a chance of one in 30. Hepatitis B, one in three. This is frightening. And uh, this syringe is the answer. It's got this cover and you turn the uh, sleeve and put it down to the end there and then lock it. So you put this little uh, adapter on like this and you then put the needle on and then put the sleeve down. You then put in the cartridge, and now it's ready to use. Then, to get rid of the needle, you put it into this container here, you turn it, and pull and the needle is removed. I've been using these, or I used them for about five or six years, and uh, it's just amazing, the um, relief using them. Um, when I didn't have the cover, um, and we had the, uh, uh, the the local anesthetic syringe on the bracket table, I'd all be, always be worrying about where the needle was. Uh, once I started using these syringes, I'd stop worrying about the needles. These are available in India from this man, Uday, so you can get them. Now, I have noticed a tremendous change in India over the years that I've been coming to India in terms of the sterilization. Uh, when I came over first, you use those big steel containers, um, which you heated up and uh, hopefully the steam might kill a few of the bugs on the outside. Um, now there's an increasing amount of uh, vacuum packing and vacuum autoclaving. Uh, the, the vacuum packing of instruments costs a lot less and it seals better. 
the vacuum packing uh, in a test, uh, they found that 100% uh, of them that they tested uh, were properly sealed. And one third of the other system where you peel off that, that tape, um, one third of them leaked and were not effective. This is a Euroseal a heat sealer, um, which is available in India. Uh, my friend in Cochin, Eldo Kochi, has got one of these. Uh, this is the Euroseal. It's a beautiful uh, piece of equipment. Uh, there are four different sizes of uh, bags. This is one third of the price of a uh, self seal pouch, which you may be using. And this is two thirds less. So you, once you've got one of these, you actually save money. Uh, you turn it on and the light goes on, showing that it's ready to use. You then uh, bring out the, uh, the, the bag to the uh, length that you need. You then push the lever down and as soon as it's uh, finished, it goes red. You then slide this knob across to the right, which cuts the bag. You then open up the lever and out comes the bag, which um, this is where it's sealed. Now, I know that you use in India, some of you, uh, a sealer, uh, which um, makes a little sealed line across. That sealed line that with the equipment that you're using is about a millimeter and a half across. Whereas the seal on this is about five millimeters. So if you're going to use the sealer that you're using at the moment, I would use it three times at each end. This is a gusseted bag, which is available in India for putting in implant kits, bigger items. It's gusseted here which means there's several different folds, which allows the bag to open up well to get bigger items in. I know that uh, Eldo Koshi in India is using, in Cochin is using these. Now, sterilizing. Steam cannot replace air. So if you're not using a vacuum autoclave, you are not sterilizing your instruments. Air has to be removed so that steam can reach the items. So a vacuum autoclave is needed. This is a vacuum autoclave. The stages of a vacuum autoclave, there's a pre-treatment stage, the sterilizing stage under vacuum, and there's the post-treatment stage. So the pre-treatment stage, steam is pumped into the chamber a vacuum is pulled, steam is pumped in, a vacuum is pulled, and this happens about four times. So the vacuum is pulled, steam is pumped in, vacuum is pulled, steam is pumped in, vacuum is pulled, steam pumped in, and then a vacuum is pulled, and then it goes up to the sterilizing temperature. This is about three to five minutes. 
and a vacuum is pulled and the vacuum is below <coughs> the, the, the atmospheric pressure is below normal temperature. So the, the water that's in the, um, in the bag uh, turns to steam and is sucked out. And then air is pumped in through a, vac a bacterial filter. Um, I was teaching sinus grafting in Delhi and I was interested when I looked at two bags and one bag had droplets of water, bags of instruments had droplets of water in it and the other one didn't have droplets of water. And I inquired about it and they said, oh yes, this one was non-vacuum autoclaved and this one was vacuum autoclaved. Also, the instruments come out dry from a vacuum autoclave. We have to check these autoclaves once a week to make sure they're working properly. And we use a thing called a Bowie Dick test, which inside has a whole lot of uh, sheets of paper. On the inside, uh, there's the test sheet which is a blue color. And when it's put into a vacuum autoclave, it looks like this. When it's put into a non-vacuum autoclave, it looks like this. So you can imagine that uh, any item that has what's called a lumen, a lumen is a hole or space, like in a handpiece or in the scissors and artery forceps where the hinge is. Um, the steam can't get in there. Or cloth items, like your drapes and your gowns, if they're cloth, they're not being sterilized. Okay. Now, the amount of vacuum autoclaves in India, I'm sure, is increasing. Um, in Abu Dhabi, they only have vacuum autoclaves. In England, under the National Health Service, a few years ago, they got rid of all the other autoclaves and put in vacuum autoclaves. I mean, these are the facts. <clears throat> you need a clothes basket uh, to put all the instruments in. <clears throat> so you need to have a checklist. Uh, for example, if we were doing a sinus graft, uh, the assistant would go to the checklist and put all the things required for the sinus graft procedure into this clothes basket, basket so that all the instruments could be brought in one at a time. I was uh, with a friend of mine in uh, Kerala and um, I noticed they hadn't got a clothes basket. So the assistant would go into the sterilizing room, bring out a few items, put them on the work surface and then go back again, get some more. So uh, I got them to get a clothes basket and this time she just put it all into the same basket and brought it all out at the same time. Now, <clears throat> washing your hands for preparing your hands for surgery, you need a, uh, a gooseneck tap. I think you call them swan neck or something. And it needs to be high enough up. So when you come to wash the soap off, you can have your elbows lower than your hands. If your tap is too low, the water drips down from your elbows onto your hands, contaminating your hands. Now, I fortunately have an ADEC chair. 
which has uh, two connections underneath. One for the uh, unit which has the hand pieces and uh, three and one syringe. And then there was a spare one, which was for holding a monitor, which I didn't need. So we had this piece of wood cut out to act as a mayo table. So you see it's attached under the chair here. So that when we're about to do surgery, all the instruments are available easily for the surgical assistant to reach or the chair side assistant to reach. Now here we're using, just watch the, the way the Mayo table is used. Also, I'd like you to watch and see how closely my hands stay next to the patient. I'll probably show you later. Um, I went to uh, Kuala Lumpur and spent two days training somebody in this sort of technique. And um, on the uh, end of the second day, he took one third of the time to do procedures compared with when we first uh, arrived. Uh, now I'm going to speed this up. And I'd like you to just see how much work my roving, my, my surgical assistant does and how uh, little work that I have to do because everything's passed to me. Notice how my hands are pretty close to the patient all the time. The assistant's changing all the burrs, all the drills. You can buy a Mayo table. Um, I think these are used in hospitals uh, to push over a bed of a patient so they can have their, their meals. They're adjustable height and uh, here's one in place. So if you don't have a place to attach a mayo table under your chair, you can use one of these. And these are available in India. Now, uh, requirements of dental stools, you need a backrest. They must be comfortable. They must be a decent sized seat and they must have five wheels to make them stable and they must move freely. I've used all sorts of stools and I'm just about to show you the best ones that I've ever had. This is an ADEX stool. Um, it's got a comfortable backrest. It's got a comfortable seat of a decent size. Now, the requirements for the dental assistant. I go to a lot of different clinics in India, and sometimes there's no uh, stool at all for the assistant. So the assistant cannot be assisting as easily as sitting comfortably. Um, or I see a relatively expensive seat for the dentist and a very cheap seat for the assistant. Uh, in my view, 
the dental assistant stool should be as high quality as the dentist stool. They must allow the assistant to sit higher than the dentist so that it is possible for the assistant to see into the mouth, to see what's going on. And it needs a footrest ring because they're going to be higher and their feet may not touch the floor. So this is a good dental assistant stool. So it's got the, uh, it's got no armrests or lap support. I'll show you about that. So it's got a comfortable back, comfortable seat. And as I said, the system must be able to look into the mouth and it needs this ring to, to rest on. So here am I working with my assistant here who's sitting a little bit higher than me and she can see down into the mouth to see what's going on. It must not have a lap support. Um, it must not have armrests. Uh, you see this one here and this one here. What you end up with is three-handed, one-elbow dentistry. The, uh, I got a video of this dentist friend doing a suture and the assistant has her elbow stuck onto the, uh, the lap rest, virtually the whole procedure. So this is three-handed, one elbow dentistry. Um, dreadful. Okay. I suggest you might all uh, just stand up and uh, take a rest for a minute. We're now going on to a new subject. Are there any questions, um, Tejas? No, not at the moment. Uh, would you be covering uh... Uh, move, move, uh, movements. Say it again. Would you be covering movements? First uh -huh. degree, second degree. Movements. Yeah, that's what we. All right. I always say that I'm extremely grateful to dental schools for not teaching people the basics. Um, that allows me to come around the world um, teaching things which you should have learned already. Um, and this is one basic thing that you should almost be taught uh, the second day at dental school. The first day at dental school, you should be taught about plaque control and dental health, then on how to handle instruments. Dentistry is, is a destructive uh, job, physically and mentally. I've had a slip disc and, and I was in depression for about 16 years. And if you speak to older dentists, they'll give you this sort of history fairly frequently. Uh, lost you there for a moment. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, did I mention that uh, I had a slip disc? Yes, after that. After that, and I was in depression for 16 years or so. Uh, and this is very common. Um, it's a very tough career. Uh, in the UK, the suicide rates, the top ones are farmers, next pharmacists, 
and the third is dentists. So we need to keep, take care of ourselves physically and mentally. The objective is to work in a way that produces the least amount of stress and that uses the least amount of energy and causes the least amount of damage to our bodies. Uh, I've been working with you now, uh, Tejas, for a year or so, and your uh, posture when you're working has improved, has it not? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now here, I'm placing a suture. You also might notice that the assistant has already got the scissors ready and has them in her left hand in a reverse grip, which I'll show you. You notice I'm using a palm grip And now I'm changed to a standard grip. I'm just pulling the thread through, helping with the need with tissue pickups. I'm now changing to a reverse grip to tie the knot. All these procedures are in my website in detail. I do a two day course on suturing and use of instruments. Now I'm presenting the knot to be cut and she's cutting the knot the suture. She, I also just put my hands out and she takes the instruments. If we look at this, speed it up. You notice how my hands and my elbows are, my elbows are down by my side most of the time. Okay. So I'm using the least amount of energy. When we look at this close up, the assistant is sitting on a comfortable seat. She's got the instruments ready to pass to me. I just move my hands slightly and she passes them to me. I'm now inserting the needle. Do you see I'm using a pen grip? And I've got the tissue pickups in a pen grip as well. The assistant's holding the scissors ready to cut the suture, left-handed, reverse grip. When Christine started working for me and I asked her to cut the suture uh, with her left hand, she said, I'm right-handed. So I said, cut the suture with your left hand. And she said, I can't use my left hand. So I asked her three times and eventually she cut the suture with her left hand. And then she said, I can't use my left hand. Now, Christine's been with me about 20 years and she would now cut a suture with her left hand if that was the best thing to use. You notice that my elbows are pretty close to my side. I'm now using a standard grip.
I'm now using a palm grip. I'm now using the tissue pickups to help pull the thread through. I'm now using palm grip, standard grip. I'm now holding the tissue pickups in the park position rather than putting the tissue pickups down. If I put them down, we then have to find them when I want to use them again. I'm now changed to the reverse grip. And I'm going over, 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 taking the small end. I'm now tightening the knot with my first finger. I'm now presenting the knot to be cut. So that the assistant knows to cut the suture. She then goes in. She also has the first finger of her right hand on the side of the scissors to stabilize them, which is safer. Like that. I now put my hands out with the instruments and she takes them. So if you see this again, you're now going to see more closely because you are more aware of the different grips. I started off with a pen grip. I'm now using the standard grip. <clears throat> I'm now pulling the thread through using the tissue pickups. I'm now using the palm grip to go through the flap, changing to the standard grip. Pulling the thread through with the tissue pickups. Parking the tissue pickups, using a reverse grip to tie the knot. Winding on to my middle uh, ring and little finger. Okay, under once, over once. Now presenting the knot be cut. Now, this is an example of a friend of mine doing the same thing. You notice he picks up the tissue pickups. The assistant is standing up. Notice his elbow. Oh, the instrument's coming a long way away from the patient's head. His hand has gone right up to his head almost. His right elbow has gone up in the air a little bit. The assistant's got the scissors in her right hand because she's right-handed. His elbow has gone up in the air. And he's putting the instruments down rather than her taking them. Okay. Now, if you look at this speeded up, you'll see how hard he works compared with how much I do. 
and how his hands come away from the patient's mouth so often. Okay. So looking at this closely, the assistant's standing up. She's got, in, she got one instrument in her hand. He takes it from her. He picks up the tissue pickups. He's then inserting the needle using the standard grip. He's now pulling the thread away from the patient's mouth, nearly touching his face. If he was wearing, uh, well, if he touched his face, he'd have to change the needle holders because they're infected then. He's now virtually touching his face. His elbows are up in the air. <coughs> He's now presenting a knot to be cut. <coughs> Now, I'm going to show you the classification of movements. I suggest you, you do these movements as I'm showing you. Uh, again, this is something that I would have liked you to have been taught on your second day at dental school. Uh, these are class one movements, just finger movements. Class two movements, elbow, uh, wrist movements. Class three, elbow movement. Class four, shoulder movement. Class five, waist movement. The ideal are class one and class two. So watch now. my elbows and my shoulders and my waist hardly move. If we see this speeded up again, just watch my hands. Elbow raised there a little bit on the left. Also notice how hard my system works. Now, when you're watching that, uh, do you think my assistant is earning her pay? Um, a lot of assistants I watch are just watching dentists work. So dentists are paying their assistant to watch them work. I pay my assistants to work hard. Now, this is the friend of mine in Kuala Lumpur, and this was the first day before we started teaching. You notice he's picking up the instruments. <clears throat> he's picking up the handpiece and he's putting the burr, the drill in. You don't have to be a qualified dentist to put drills in handpieces. Now I'm going to show you speed it up and just look and see how hard he works. Uh -huh. Just one second. And look at his posture.
Now his his other assistant is just standing around somewhere. Oh, she's actually, the other assistant's done something. Okay, now if we move on to two weeks, uh, two days later in the afternoon, we videoed him again. I'd like you to watch his posture and the setup. If you now see this speeded up, just watch and see his, his body movements now. As I said, he did uh, four different procedures uh, at the beginning of the two days and then at the end of the second day, he took one third of the amount of time. Now that means that if he continued like this, he could take two thirds of the year off and earn the same amount of money, or he could earn two thirds more money. So class one and class two movements, you use the least amount of energy, less neck pain, less back pain, greater, product, greater productivity. Now I've showed you this. Uh, these are the different instrument grips. This is the standard grip finger going along towards the tips, thumb in there, and ring finger, and the pad of the ring finger only, and the first finger going straight down the beaks, just the pad. Don't have a finger sticking out like this, you might stick it in the patient eye or something. Uh, for little fingers, you can put two fingers in, gives you greater strength. Now using both hands, you both use both hands typing on a computer. You actually use your left hand more than your right hand. It's about 56% of the time you're using your left hand. Tying knots, you use both hands. Driving a car, you use both hands. Playing musical instruments, you use both hands. And the reason why you're using your non-dominant hands as much in these procedures is because you've taught your non-dominant hand. Whereas in dentistry, you tend to only to use, use your dominant hand. So if your elbows are raised, it means you've got the wrong grip or you're using the wrong hand. 
So using both hands is better for your posture. So this is the left-handed grip. You've got uh, two fingers in, if you've got little fingers. This is the right-handed reverse grip. Put two fingers in if necessary. This is the pen grip. This is the palm grip. So here I'm using the pen grip, my elbows down at my side. Here I'm using the reverse grip, my arms down at my side, my elbow. Now I'm using the palm grip, which is not as good. The elbow is raised, the shoulders raised. I'm now using the standard grip, and you can see how bad the standard grip is. And most dentists use the standard grip. And if after today you watch other dentists work, just see how many times they should be using a different grip. So they're not raising their elbow and their shoulder like this. The upper right, pen grip, reverse grip, elbow at the side, palm grip, the elbow is raised, the shoulders raised, and the standard grip. Every time the standard grip comes out pretty badly, or nearly every time. Lower anterior, pen grip, palm grip, uh, sorry, reverse grip, palm grip. Standard grip's not bad there. It's about the only place in the mouth where it's good. Lower left side, pen grip, reverse grip, palm grip, standard grip. One person I taught said to me about three months later that they virtually didn't use the standard grip anymore. They use the reverse grip virtually all the time. So this is the lower right pen grip, palm grip, standard grip. Now left-handed, reverse grip, put two fingers in if necessary, pen grip, palm grip, This is using left hand, reverse grip, palm grip, standard grips, not so good. Now, if you look at the different groups that I'm using here, using the pen grip at the moment, changing to the standard grip, Notice how my elbows are down by my side. I'm pulling the thread through using the needle holders and the tissue pickups. Now using the palm grip to insert the needle. Using my ring finger, little finger to help tight, wind the thread on. Now using reverse grip, as you can see, using my first finger to help tighten the knot.
So seeing that speed it up. How are we doing for time? Uh, We've got some more time. Uh, 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 Sarva, can we have another, uh, say, 20 minutes? Yeah, please go ahead. All right. Uh, Stuart, there's a, uh, before you go ahead, uh, two questions. Yes. Uh, one from uh, uh, Dr. Chakradar. Can you please go ahead with your question? Yeah, uh, I would like to ask, uh, sir, regarding the kind of suture material, what he prefers and what suturing technique is the most go-to uh, in regular cases? Uh, that's my uh, two-day course. Um, how much time, more time have we got? About 20 minutes, like still 7.30, say about uh, half an hour more. Okay, right. Um, I'll try and answer that question for you if we have time, okay? Um, I think probably being realistic, uh, silk sutures for uh, very uh, simple things like wisdom teeth and um, simple surgeries, and then uh, I would use Vicryl or something like that uh, for uh, for grafting procedures and more complicated things. The other question? Another question from uh, Dr. Devaka. Can you please uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, dear Jones, good evening. Hello. 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 Dr. Jones, hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Hello. What is the question, yeah. Tejas? So you have been, uh, yeah. So you know the both environment in working, working environments in UK and as well as in India. So what is the main uh, differences you find in uh, dentistry in India that a dentist from India should uh, need to improve? Um, well, uh, I think Tejas uh, can understand my feelings about this, uh, having worked with him and uh, five or six others. Um, uh, I think that... Um, uh, <laughs> Dentistry basically is very bad in all the world. Uh, in America, the UK, India, very place, very very few places practice dentistry as it should be practiced. Um, I think that uh, there is probably. I mean, I, I don't know much about English dentistry because I only practiced by myself and I didn't uh, teach much in England. Um, I think that uh, there needs to be, a, I would say that in America and maybe the UK, the, uh, the running of the practices, the the organization is probably considerably better than India. Um, I spend a lot of my time with my friends in India uh, talking about efficiency and um, uh, set up lists and procedure lists. Um, yeah, okay. Um, was there another question or was that? Yeah, part of the question was, uh, what, uh, what do Indian dentists, uh, what should Indian dentists 
get additional training in in order to improve quality of working um i have i'm totally biased on this um and uh, my answer would be go to my website it's all on there uh, tejas what uh, was that arrogance or was it true? Absolutely true. I, I don't think it's arrogance at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, come and see me when I'm in India sometime. And I'll talk to you about it. Okay. <laughs> but I, the fact yeah, that you asked true. the fact that you asked the question is very important. Okay. Um, let me just. Uh, Let me just um, move to a different subject. Okay. Okay, uh, if you take a photograph of this, um, you can go to these two presentations um, and look at it in detail. Um, now, um, the anatomy of needles. This is the tip. This is the body, and this is the swaged end, or uh, where you tie the knot. Now, this is a cutting needle. It's got the sharp edge on the inside and the blunt on the outside. When you put this in, the sharp part is on the inside, and this is what can happen with a cutting needle. Also, because the sharp part is at the top, the thread can pull out. This is a needle in a packet, and it's got a triangle there with the sharp bit of the triangle at the top. This is a cutting needle. It also says cutting on there. And this is a 3-0 gauge, which is the commonest gauge to use in dentistry. And this is a silk suture, in fact. Cutting needles have no place in dentistry. Round needles tend to rotate in the needle holders. So I wouldn't recommend round needles. Now this is reverse cutting. It's flat on the inside and sharp on the outside. So <clears throat> the flat bit is at the top here, and this is less likely to cut out. Also, the fact that the cut is flat at the top makes it less likely for the thread to pull out. So this is a 3-0 gauge reverse cutting suture. Now we can't do this <clears throat> because we're on Zoom, I don't think. But if I have a group of 30 dentists and I say, 
how many of you using how many are of you are using reverse cutting sutures uh, needles uh, out of 30 about two or three put up their hands uh, I then say who are using cutting needles and four or five put up their hands and then I say how many of you don't know whether you're using cutting or reverse cutting and about 10 to 15 uh, put up their hands quite extraordinary that you can get out of dental school and you don't know what needle you're using <clears throat> also what is the length of the suture you're using this is 45 uh, centimeters this is ideal for dentistry. This is 75 centimeters. Uh, you can only have 75 centimeter sutures in Abu Dhabi. I've been going there for about 10 or 15 years now, and they haven't discovered the technique of being able to persuade the importers to import 45 centimeter thread. So here I'm inserting a 75 centimeter suture. Now, uh, I talked to you about using the tissue pickups to help uh, bring the thread through. That makes it so I don't have to stand up. Now, if you're tying the knot on a 75 centimeter suture, Now this time I'm winding on at least with my left hand. You'll notice that I don't have to raise my hand away from the patient so much. So I'm winding on with my ring finger and little finger, but I'm having to do it quite a few times. Now, this is my friend Eldu Koshi, who very kindly allowed me to uh, video him putting a suture in. Now I'm standing behind the tripod with the camera, trying to keep a straight face. And I said to Aldo, how long is your suture? And he didn't know. So when I got home, I made a 90 centimeter suture. So I suggest you uh, work out 
if you make your own sutures, I should work out uh, how much length is needed for the knot, then add it on to 45 centimeters. And um, I've been teaching uh, suturing to my little group in India over the last week or two. And we've just started using uh, real sutures as opposed to string, which we used to start with. And um, uh, I say, you know, um, cut the suture length to about 55 centimeters, in fact, which allows for the knot and then the cutting of the end when you're tying the knot. Um, and uh, some of the participants don't do that and they got string that's far too long or sutures are far too long. So here I'm having to wind on with this 90 centimeter suture. So I'm a bit like Elder. So now, uh, suturing a flap like this, where you're going to graft in the center, you need to make your incision one tooth and one pillar away from the graft side. The closer the suture line is to the graft side, the greater the chance of infection. So you take the whole papilla, as I showed you before. Now, this is a technique which I only learned recently. It's a way of raising a flap where you're raising it round teeth. You make initial stab cuts like this. This gets you thinking surgically. You may not have been doing surgery that day. And by doing this, this is more accurate to start with. Having done that, you then go round like this. So you're in the sulcus like this. And then you go up the um, <coughs> relieving incision. That's a more accurate way of making the incision. Then you take the periosteal elevator, finger on top, turn the elevator, and then raise the relieving incision. Now, when you come to suture up, you've got two problems. First problem is when suturing, the tissue over the canine is very thin. And I can almost remember several times tearing the tissue while I tried to suture from the loose flap to the tissue over the canine. So there's a risk, a very high risk of tearing the tissue over the canine. The second problem is to get the papilla up into the interdental space. There are two solutions to suturing over the canine. And I wish I'd known this earlier. You raise the flap over the canine, you raise the tissue over the canine. This means that when you go into the loose flap, you can go under that new flap without tearing the tissue. The second solution to not tearing the tissue 
is to choose the right needle, which is a reverse cutting. I suggest to you all, if you don't know what uh, sutures you've got it in your clinic, is to go and have a look. Secondly, if you've got cutting needles, you can do one of two things. One is to continue using them until you're finished and then use reverse cutting from then on. Or you can collect all your cutting needles, put them in a bag and go and see your dentist who you dislike most and give them to him. Okay. And let him suffer. So, using reverse cutting, you're less likely to tear the tissue. Don't use cutting needles. Otherwise, you'll have this happen. The second problem is getting the papilla up into the indental space. If you suture from the outside, when you try and tie the knot, it doesn't pull the papilla up into the interdental space. So you go from the palate and then into the labial papilla like this. Then you go back through the space And when you then tie the knot, it pulls the papilla up into the space. You then end up with the knot on the inside, which can be irritating to the patient. So you could etch the lingual, the palatal surface of these two teeth and put on some flowable composite while during the healing period. Then you don't have the patient telephone up saying how irritating the knot is. So you go in like this. You then go through the papilla. You then go through the space and then you tie the knot. Then in this particular case, you do a locking continuous suture. You put the needle through the loop to make the lock. Now there's a, a tip here in terms of making life easier. When you come to finish the continuous suture, go in with the needle holders, do not lock. Lift to the top of the, the loop, then lock, and then pull it through. When you do that, this is the next throw. When you do this and raise it up and then lock, you pull all that loop through. If you don't go to the top and you pull the loop through, you then have to mess around trying to pull the rest of the loop through, which is boring. And then presenting the knot to be cut. The person who comes to cut the suture waits. The dentist then says a little bit longer or a little bit shorter, and then yes. And the assistant then cuts. <coughs> Thank you.
Uh, There's a question, Stuart. Say it again. The question from uh, Dr. Surabhi. Yeah. Surabhi, go ahead. Can you just tell me the question? Uh, she wants you to repeat this technique once, and then she's asking if this will create Uh, you've frozen at the moment. Can you un unmute? Yes. Not Can you hear me? Again. Yeah. So she, uh, one, she's asking you if this will create any tension in the flap. And would that require uh, the flap to be released buckly? Can I interrupt? Yeah, sir, be go ahead, please. Please go ahead. Yeah. That was the question. When uh, uh, when we inserted the middle uh, from the palatal side, right? And then yes. we are, uh, the uh, buckle uh, thing, buckle uh, side of the flap, and pulling it, right? Yes. Yes. So are we not creating uh, tension over the uh, buckle uh, thing? The buckle flap okay. is already loose. You've already raised the buckle flap. But so you we want, are doing uh, But we are doing want, the technique. Then it is uh, short, right? And then this so will get the papilla inside the interdental space. We are pulling it. Are we not creating tension? Cannot we uh, just uh, release the flap? Surabi. Do... Surabi. Yeah. Uh, if you tug on it hard, you'll produce some uh, ischemia in the papilla. So you don't, you, you just do it very delicately, pulling that papilla up into the interdental space. You don't mm -hmm. pull it violently. Okay. And the other question? Uh, she uh, wants yeah. you to, give, yeah, go ahead. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can we, uh, sorry, can you uh, repeat this uh, loop technique once again, please? The interrupted sutures. Yeah. Uh, in the, uh, Stuart, in the interest of time, can, can we share this presentation with the participants so that uh, the detailed presentation? Yes. I think that will answer uh, yeah. Survey's question. Yeah. There's an animation in the presentation, Survi, a video animation. Yeah. You can uh, go through that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll send you the answer to that, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, there, there is a video, sorry, a presentation which shows exactly how to do the, the, um, the locking continuous suture, okay? Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, now holding the needle, uh, hold it at right angles to the needle, to the needle holders, not like this. If you start off like this, you put the needle into the tissue and it comes out where you didn't expect it to. Uh, you need to do it, hold it uh, at right angles and one third from the swaged end or the, the knot end, one third. If you're going through thick tissue and you hold it at the end, you bend the needle. And we've all done this, okay? Um, and since I've been using, holding the needle one third from the swaged end, this hasn't happened. So, this is holding, taking the needle one third from the swaged end. Having put it through the tissue to start with, then you may have to go to the swaged end to push it a bit further, which I'll show you. Occasionally, if you're suturing at the back of the mouth away from you, then you may need to hold it like this, but this is pretty rare. Now, 
I would like to use half circle, uh, but I think that I've been using three eighths. Now, when you suture at the back of the mouth here, uh, having gone all the way to the back with your continuous suture, needles have a sense of humor. You put the needle in and the tip doesn't come out. And this can be frustrating at the end of a difficult procedure. So the solution to this is to use a needle like this, which goes in and comes out more easily. Uh, you can buy these as I did to start with. And then I learned how to bend a needle. So you can take a five eighth and bend it. Just one second. Now, this is if you've got a little hole in the side of your uh, uh, tissue pickups. If you do this next time you're suturing at the back of the mouth and bend the needle, send me an email saying, thank you, Stuart, that made all the difference. You may have some needle holders that don't have uh, some tissue pickups that don't have a hole in the in the side. So in that case, you can just take them like this. Oh, that's the same one. You can then take them like this and bend it like this. So that's a great help at the back of the mouth. Maybe just move on a little bit. Another five to eight minutes to it. Right. Um, so I've got the uh, needle uh, one third from the swaged end. I'm now pushing it into the loose flap and into the thick uh, tissue in the palate. I'm now going to change to holding it at the swaged end. And I'm going to push it a bit further. So had I started off with it held at the swaged end, I might have bent the needle like this. So you go in like this and then take the end and push it further. So if you haven't taken a photograph of this, I should do. Do we have the email addresses of everybody, uh, Tejas? Uh, no, I'll get them. Uh, uh, I'll share them with you once uh, okay. this is. Up. Then I can send you more information. Okay. Um, we've got through pretty well everything I wanted to get through. I was going to go through Luxators a bit more detail. Um, but I can send you the link to my uh, website to be able to look at that. On my website, you can either just view 
the presentation or you can download the presentations. There's no charge for this. The only payment that you can give me is to send me an email and tell me what you think of the presentation. And I often uh, change presentations frequently uh, because of people's suggestions. Okay, so what time is it with you now? It's about 7.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can, can we open uh, the, the floor to questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, right, that was a great presentation and a lot of insights from you. Uh, I, I want to rename this session to stuff that I should have learned in dental school. Yes. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I open this to all the participants. If you have any questions, kindly unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself to Stuart, and then please ask your question. Thank you. One, one thing that I, I do when I'm teaching is to look at the most enthusiastic person in the group because that gives me energy. Uh, I try and avoid looking at people who are asleep and, and not looking happy uh, because that, that wears me out psychologically. So I can see uh, in Team IDA Voltaire, um, the young chap there has been smiling and uh, uh, appreciating what I'm teaching and that's been an encouragement to me. So thank you very much. I, I enjoyed your company. Uh, the others, I I can only see your names mainly. And uh, and Stuart, a uh, small request, and I request all. Uh, we'll just take a photo of all the members. If they switch on the videos, uh, we can have a screenshot. What do you suggest? Uh, if I had the email addresses and also a photograph, that would be very helpful for me. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to Tejas. He'll be giving it to you. Uh, meanwhile, uh, everyone, can you switch on the videos, please, for the screenshot? Everyone, all of you. Jyotsna, Chaitanya, Vishnupriya, Deepa Lakshmi, everyone. Chandra Deka. Make sure you're awake. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we've got John Thomas. We've got some. Yeah. Sunil, we've got some lovely feet there. <clears throat> I think Sunil's gone to sleep. Uh, meanwhile, can I ask one question? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, there are times when uh, local anesthesia is working, right? It's not but, working. Uh, it's working. Yes. We have symptoms like uh, while uh, we have injected uh, inferior alveolar, we have given inferior alveolar nerve block, it is working completely, right? All symptoms are present, like the lips are numb, the side of the tongue is numb, even the long buckle is working. But as soon as uh, we start the tooth, right, patient kind of jumps off. Is there any solution to it? Can you repeat? Rarely happens. What happens? Tejas? Do I have to repeat? Sir, we please repeat. There's a, a breakage in your voice. Can you please repeat? Okay, okay. I'll just repeat. Uh, uh, if suppose I've given inferior alveolar nerve block, all the symptoms are present, right? The lips are numb, the long buckle is working, the cheek is numb, the buckle mucosa, uh, the uh, lateral border of the tongue is numb, right? Everything is working. But as soon as we touch the concerned tooth for which we have given the anesthesia, the patient just jumps up from the chair. It rarely happens, but it happens sometimes. 
So is there any solution to it? Is there a solution? Yeah. What um, can be the possible? Uh, you need an interdental um, <clears throat> there is a, a, a syringe for injecting down into the into the periodontal membrane. Yeah. You know those stages? A pressure syringe. A pressure is that, uh, that it, yes. Would that solve the problem? No. Is that, that, that answered the question, Tejas? Uh, Sir, can you repeat that last one? I, I, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, the intraligamentary injections cause 99% of the time, but uh, do we need to, uh, you know, add uh, sodium bicarbonate? Uh, for the pH of uh, the infected area to neutralize it, or do we need to add something to our local anesthetic? Can you answer that, Tejas? Mm. No, she is asking. She, she wants to know if you want to add something to the local anesthetic solution. To be more effective. For it to be more effective. Yeah, uh, like a sodium bicarbonate. To, to buffer it uh, you know, or something. I can't say I've ever added anything to a local anesthetic. <clears throat> uh, actually, I had a talk with uh, an anesthetist and uh, he told me that uh, you should uh, buffer it with 2% uh, sodium bicarbonate. So uh, I tried it a couple of times. After the giving block, I uh, inject uh, intra ligament with that buffered solution. So is it uh, advisable that we should uh, inject that little space with uh, buffered solution? That was my question. You, have you already done it on patients? I have I've been doing it regularly, but the question is there in my mind that uh, it should not be you know, necrosis or something. I'm skeptical about it. But it's working. You must share your experience. Okay. You have the question, you have the answer. Yes, so yeah, skeptical about it. That's why I uh, put it in front of everyone. I don't know the answer to what you're saying. <clears throat> I know everything, but not every, not not absolutely everything. Great. Any so other doctors? Any other questions? Who have questions? Banamati, ma'am? Yes, yes. See, what I have found when you do an impaction, the impaction is over, but the moment you suture, the patient jumps. So sometimes I have to inject again in that uh, area that has to be sutured. That happens very commonly. Patient is not able to tolerate that um, needle, the suture needle prick. I've um, experienced it most of the times, like. Have you experienced that, Tejas? Uh, yes, if the procedure is quite long. Not very long, say 45 minutes to one hour, not more than that. Uh, but during suturing alone, the patient, uh, like uh, it really hurts when you take the bite. Hmm. I think you just have to go ahead and put some more local and set again. <clears throat> then my second question is on uh, earlier, uh, doctor, I told about how frequently you change your brush. Like uh, when should you change your brush? And now recently, yesterday, that Oral-B person 
came with a, a, a what a, a brush with a magnetic sensor and artificial intelligence which is sold at 15000 it has a track recorder bluetooth uh, version something like that and it for doctors it's sold at 9000 rupees so i just wanted to know like and i asked him does it have provision for an interdental cleaning and he says there are bristles that will reach all the areas of the all the curvatures of the tooth so about that i love this i love this question um clarify am i right in thinking that um the question is how often should you change your toothbrush yeah. hygienists hygienists teach how often okay now um banu mathi uh, yes uh, you have a kitchen <laughs> you have a kitchen uh, do you have a brush for cleaning the plates scrubber scrubber <laughs> you do okay uh, we tend to use uh, brushes for brushing the plates okay and the question oh. is how often should you change the brush uh -huh. I have a toothbrush which was given to me by a friend of mine in Oregon in the USA and um it's about 4 years old okay uh I I use it for traveling and I do have another brush there um the answer to how long how long does a toothbrush last the answer is however long it lasts it's it the technique the technique is usually where the problem is no now i'll tell you something else if you get calculus on your teeth it is because you're not brushing correctly so if a patient knows how to really clean properly they do not need a scaling and if you go to my website and you look at the how to use the um bass technique of brushing and you do that i think it probably takes me 10 to 15 minutes to clean my teeth using a uh soft toothbrush into dental brushes and toothpicks i've not taught flossing for 35 years and people i talk to who use floss use waxed floss which is not what you're supposed to use you're supposed to use unwaxed floss if you're going to use floss but if i teach 1000 people to use toothpicks and 1000 people to use floss i know that the toothpicking people are going to be in 5 years time much more frequently using toothpicks rather than flo than floss um if i was to go back into doing clinical dentistry again i'd want to do two things one is plaque control and the other is sinus grafting they are the most rewarding and exciting things to do for me how uh, we doing thank you time? thank you so much uh, uh, we have we can take uh, maybe one or two more questions dr jitendra kumar uh, is asking a question please go ahead sir hi dr stewart i just wanted to ask you uh, which is the best place to sit around the patient like i am a right handed dentist and should i be sitting to the right of the patient or behind the patient for the best comfort when i had a back problem also okay, yeah mm -hmm. where should i place my stool around the patient um do, uh, get me? do, do you want um Uh, positioning my stool around the patient's chair okay uh, which is the most comfortable position do you think if i'm a right handed dentist should i put it yeah. to the right of the patient or behind the patient uh it depends what you're doing 
Okay. Okay. Um, uh, if if behind the if you're sitting behind the patient, that's twelve o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you can work anywhere from nine o'clock to twelve o'clock. Okay. Uh, okay. And very occasionally, <laughs> sitting on the assistant side. Um, uh, treatment room design is one of my favorite subjects because okay. every single place I go to is wrong. I know, I know. Okay. Because, uh, uh, listening to your lecture, I think I, I have to modify my clinic setup too. Yeah. So I think I've been working a little bit wrong too. And uh, I'd had issues with my back and neck and yes. uh, a lot of correction, I guess. So yes. I was just wondering if I can do something about that. No, I think you just have to sit where it's most convenient at that for that particular procedure, really. Um, okay. Sometimes on the lower right, uh, on the lower right, uh, nine o'clock is the best. Okay. Uh, probably on the lower left and upper left, probably 12 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, but that's, um, that's, a, that's another two-day lecture. <laughs> okay. I understood. I understood. It's uh, it's a lot of uh, uh, thinking and modification, I guess, and you have yes. to be uh, selective to each patient and each kind of treatment that we are going to yes. uh, do at the moment. Right now. Uh, yeah. Another thing, um, my dental chair has four programs. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have the upright position is slightly back. Uh, because they can get in and out of the chair very easily, even if it's slightly back. Okay, okay. slightly. It then goes, that's the, the zero. The one position is here, which is halfway back. And I get them to go halfway back, and then I talk to them a moment or two for their blood pressure to get sorted out. And then I go to the next position, which is the lower jaw position. And then I go to the upper jaw position. Okay. Um, in my, did you, did you get my email address? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've uh, taken a snap of that. Okay, good. Send me an email the... and I'll send you uh, a link to the use of dental chairs. Yeah, sure, sure, I'll get to you. Most dentists, when I see them working, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna ask you to answer this question, everybody, but do you use the uh, lower jaw position and the upper jaw position? You just- I'm not quite sure of that. <laughs> you're not quite sure, yes. Okay. Um, I just try to uh, uh, take my uh, working place at the, at my elbow level. Oh yes, that, I mean that's another factor too. But but um, you need to be looking at. Uh, you see, a, a, a friend of mine bought two dental chairs. I designed his clinic. Okay. He bought two dental chairs without seeing them. And they had the possibility of four programs but that cost more money so he didn't have that part of the program so mm -hmm. now uh, he or his assistant spends hours pressing buttons going up and down chair up and down and you know just right. i would just walk into the treatment room the assistant would have pressed one and then two, and if it's an upper filling, she'd press three. That's and also, also tilt the head back a bit. Now that's that's for somebody who doesn't have any problems. Somebody with um, some gastric problems or heart problems, you obviously have to treat them up a little bit. Um, I... Uh, my, my grandfather was a dentist, and he treated people standing up. And when he died, he was about, 
He was about a foot shorter than when he, when he was a young man. My mother was a dentist. She worked standing up and the same thing happened. Okay. Um, they both worked standing up. When I went to dental school in 1960s, uh, I immediately sat down to work straight away. Um, I have a very prominent friend in America who is from India and he works standing up. It's crazy. I wouldn't type standing up all the time, maybe occasionally, but you know, um, the, okay. the efficiency of which of how people are working. Uh, I was teaching somebody in Kerala and I said to him, um, have your assistant set up for a composite filling. And I'd done some training with her and, and, and the dentist. And uh, I said to the dentist, tell me when you're ready. So he sat there ready, okay, with his mask on. I went over to him and I lifted his mask and I said, open your mouth. And I put a cotton roll in the front, in between his up teeth. I then put another mask over his eyes. And there was a mannequin in the chair, okay? I said, now, I said, now go ahead and do the filling. And his assistant had to pass him everything without him reaching for things. He didn't actually drill the tooth uh, in the mannequin. And at the end of it, he said, that was an amazing experience. It just stopped him from taking things off the assistant. Hmm. I have to train your office assistant properly. Tejas, um, can we finish now? And yes, please. Could we have a one and a half minute, thank you, Stuart, lecture? <laughs> Would you prefer one and a half? <laughs> thank you, sir. Stuart, a last question from my side. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, what precautions you take to avoid a, a dry socket? Before you extract the tooth, what precautions you take for males and females? I would make sure that I've got some of that. Um, uh, what's that stuff you put in the socket, Tejas? This is after the dry socket is occurred or before? After the dry socket. Uh, I just use ink oxide usually. No, Alveo gel. Yeah, thank you. That's the stuff to have. You, you, oh. have, that, you have that in a reserve. And because you've got it in the clinic, you'll never have a dry socket. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I think um, I think dry sockets are, um, I was going to say, an enigma. Uh, why you get dry sockets and why you don't, I have no idea. Any pre-medications or any, anything else? No, because I think that dry sockets, in my experience, were very rare. And if you're going to give everybody, I think for wisdom teeth, I would always give antibiotic. Um, probably amoxicillin an hour before, and then uh, five days of, of, of uh, antibiotic afterwards. Um, but for ordinary extractions, I wouldn't. Okay. But I don't okay. think it's predictive. I don't think it's predictable when you're going to get a dry socket. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. But that, you, you need, uh, Tejas, you must get some Algocil. Alvagil. Is it? Alvagil, yes, Alvagil. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 I think that makes a big difference. Okay. All right, so... Yeah, thank you. That was a very, very insightful uh, presentation. Good. And I, I appreciate that the audience participated. A big, big thank you to Stuart, who's made time for this presentation. And a big thank you to Team IDA Voltaire. Uh, I think your enthusiasm has been the driving force behind this uh, program. So uh, in closing, I would say... I have learned a great many lessons from Stuart. 
And uh, the result today is uh, I work less than I used to work before I met Stuart. And I'm more satisfied now. So uh, I really suggest all of you look at uh, his website. There's a ton of information there. And uh, uh, also I'm excited to announce that uh, Stuart may be in India soon. So I'll keep you all posted. And uh, there's an exciting workshops coming your way. So with that signing out from Hyderabad and Stuart signing out from UK and team Voltaire from Vizac, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot, a big, big applause. And, and Bill, keep, in touch. Yeah. keep in contact with me, okay? Send me a and, and write to Stuart, please. Cheers, then. Yeah. Bye. Cheers. Dr. Tejas, Dr. Tejas, that was 1.5 minutes only. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, uh, right. can we have another session on occlusion? Any other time on occlusion or any other topic? You, you both discuss and let me know, Tejas. All right. I'll, I'll uh, let you know. Any time. Any time. After three months, six months, your wish. All right. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do something. Sure. Yeah, let me recover from this one first. <laughs> now, I want you to know what a sacrifice I've made because normally lunchtime on Sunday, I go for a pint of beer at my pub. <laughs> I have not been able to. But Thank I you. Made, Thanks a lot. I may we'll, go we'll, now. I may go we'll, now. We'll give you a treat when you come to Vishakhapatnam. We'll make it up. Oh, good. <laughs> Okay, I've got some kingfisher in my in my uh, free my fridge. By the way. Okay, sir. Thanks okay. a lot. Bye then. Bye. You need to welcome you to uh, to Nagpur, but um, I may not be welcoming you with kingfisher now. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Tejas? So. She welcomes you to Nagpur, but it's uh, she says it's going to be a dry place, so no alcohol. So, by the way, uh, if there's any questions that that haven't been answered, please uh, email Stuart or just put it in the group, and I'll I'll forward it to him. He'll he'll answer it at a later time. Is he right, being serious? Uh, after the beer, yes, sure. <laughs> okay, bye, bye everybody. Bye, Sir. 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 Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Team IDA. Thanks for.